Hello, you're all very welcome to the Celtic Soul Podcast with me, Andrew Millen. This episode has been kindly sponsored by the Badass Cafe, Temple Bar Dublin, the home of Nave Porrig Celtic Supporters Club. Coming up on the Celtic Soul Podcast today, I will be speaking to Anthony Joseph. Born in Aberdeen, he joined the Celtic Supporters Club and has been following in Celtic home and away ever since. He's also a member of the Tartan Army and follows Scotland throughout Europe. In his working life, he's a journalist and is currently working for Sky Sports News as an editor. I love Glasgow. I love going to visit it on a regular basis and take a game in and a night out. It's a melting pot of cultures. A typical trip would see me landing in Glasgow Airport and taking the bus into the city to my favourite hotel, the Arto, owned by an Indian family and home to the Bombay Blues restaurant, where I've enjoyed many a good meal. Then it's en route to Celtic Park, where I might stop off in an Irish pub for a drink, or I might stop off in a Scottish one, or even an Italian one. I watch a team on the pitch made up of men who come from many backgrounds, many cultures, many countries, and many colours. Many of those will have come from immigrant backgrounds, where their ancestors will have went in search of a better life and carved out a new life. How proud they must be of the young men making it big on the football field, with 60,000 fans cheering them on. Many of those fans will be from immigrant backgrounds themselves, who after generations of bigotry are now reaching the highs of their chosen careers. But there is a nasty element in Glasgow who believe they are the people shouting support for Churchill while they see Kyle Hitler style, singing Rule Britannia as seen in Georgia Square this week. Their views are confusing. They don't want to accept that all religions have the same rights as them to exist in Scotland side by side, that immigrants and refugees are welcome. That Scotland has the right to pursue independence from Britain through peaceful means. Scotland, like Ireland, my home, are both countries of many cultures. And riding on the streets while half pissed will not stop the majority from living their lives while helping those who come in search of a better life. Just like Brother Warford helped the Glasgow Irish, Celtic is a club for all. So earlier on I spoke to Anthony Joseph about following Celtic, Scotland and his career in the media. And here's how we got on. I first met Anthony Joseph in the old coach park of Celtic Park. Anthony was looking to cut his teeth as a student journalist and he was looking to contribute to the fanzine. Anthony would go on to write for us during those student years before moving into local newspapers and then the Nationals, where he has won awards and he's currently working as an editor with Sky Sports News. Hi, Anthony. You're very welcome to the Celtic Soul podcast. You've come a long way since our first meeting at Celtic Park. You're now living down in London. Do you miss home and... How's life been since the lockdown down in London? <laughs> yeah, Andrew, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be on. And uh, yeah, London's London's great uh, so far. And well, I say so far, I've been here for five years now. I can't believe that. It uh, feels like such a long time ago, but also gone so quick. But yeah, a very long, a long time since uh, we first met when I was maybe what, 16, 17. I'm just trying to get some work published and some opinions across and things like that when I was trying to get uh, a portfolio of journalist work to help me and it definitely helped me because uh, I failed my higher English so I, it was my por- portfolio of work that got me into uni in the end after college. And Anthony, I know your love of football because I, I've known you as you said you're about 16. You love following Celtic, you're a proud Scottish man, you like following, I love following your national team but to those who don't know you, can you just paint a picture of yourself and who you are and where you come from? Well, I'm uh, from Aberdeen and lived in Aberdeen for most of my life. I grew up there, uh, had sort of like a Catholic upbringing with uh, going to St. Joseph's Primary School. My parents are all uh, Christian backgrounds, well, with my grandparents. But uh, my grandparents and my parents both from India, so... Yes, if we're uh, talking, uh, I would be classed as uh, BAME in the UK, but I, I don't identify myself as that really, even though I am that. I am just Scottish. If anyone was asking me where I come from, I'm from Aberdeen and I'm, I'm Scottish. I've been a Celtic fan all my life, ever since primary school. I've been a season ticket holder for many years, going home and away and abroad. And same with Scotland, going to Scotland Games home and, home and abroad. And that's what I love doing. And that's what I've always loved doing. And I've been lucky enough to also work in football, pursue my dream as a journalist and get on many trips with Scotland or Celtic, but Aberdeen mainly when working in local journalism up at the Evening Express. But uh, 
yeah, that's that's me until I came down to came down to London to work for Mail Online, and that was a good three and a half years there, learning all about online journalism at, at the biggest news website in the world. I know many people have their opinions of it, but it was definitely a huge learning curve, and it set me set me up for what I do now, especially at uh, Sky Sports News, working in TV, but also uh, helping out on digital platforms as they try to to grow that and thinking about new media I did a little spell um, a year and a half at Kicker Media in between that and uh, that was all about new media and doing like very soccer AM style videos with footballers and things that would go out on Instagram and mobile networks in countries all over the world and it was all about finding that unique kind of content that wasn't just the oh we're going to get three points next week we're asking stories about lives it was all about footballers lives and what they love doing because there's nothing football footballers really open up when you talk about their passions and that was that's something I think is strong that you see in new media in terms of Instagram it's the stories and Facebook the stories that do really well are stuff about footballers lives and uh those are the kind of interesting stories we were trying to portray there, and it's uh, also set me up for uh, with my news background doing Sky Sports, Sky Sports News, and also doing the kind of footballers' live stories as well. Just for the listenership, you gave us an abbreviation of how you're described. You describe yourself as Scottish. Yeah. What does the abbreviation stand for? The B A M E. Yes. Yeah, in the UK that means uh, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic. So anyone who's an ethnic minority. In, in the UK is classed as BAME. And colour-based? Colour-based, but yeah, ethnic by ethnic origin, really. It's, yeah, so I'm I am brown by colour, but I, I very rarely ident- identify myself as being Asian or being from India because, just because my parents or grandparents are from there. I'm from where I'm from, which is Scotland and Aberdeen. And I'm not where my grandparents are from. This is this is me. So that's usually why I, I don't usually like to define myself by my ethnic origin. I'd rather define myself by my own nationality. We've had, obviously, over the last couple of weeks, we've had the Black Lives Matter movement being mm-hmm. backed by sporting stars when up until then, you know, it was downplayed. You know, politics had no place in sport, especially in football. Now, you have experienced direct racism over the years. Can you force you tell me about those experiences? You wrote an article for the website yesterday about indirect racism. But force can you tell me about your experience with direct racism? Yeah, direct racism. Luckily, I think I've got off lightly, maybe, I could say. But I have experienced it, and it, has, it can be awful. I've had... Um, Someone from my school, a few years older than me, uh, constantly saying racist words and telling me to go home, go back to my own country, calling me a packy, things like that uh, on MSN. I've had uh, times where where I've come back from a game and uh, just in a pub in, in the local pub in Port Lethen and, and myself and my mate Stephen Keller just having a quiet pint. And uh, there was two, there was a couple, and they were both Rangers fans who'd obviously watched the game in the pub um, and were just starting, just chatting to us normally first. And then it suddenly started getting quite aggressive and then started calling me a Fenian packy and turned into a bit of a, an incident in the pub. And so obviously I, I was just stunned. We were just there for a quiet pint. It was quite hard to take. Also on Twitter, I've had a lot of very direct racist abuse which has been hard hard to take as well but I think I've got a thick enough skin to to deal with it because now I realize that these people are just ignorant and idiots and often especially on Twitter you can hide behind a username people might not even say that but even they know what they're saying is disgusting and that's why they're saying it they want a reaction they want to hurt me in that way uh, and that differs to indirect racism, obviously, which is what I've written about just because of the Black Lives, a huge part of the Black Lives Matter movement is is about racial profiling, is about indirect racism, subconscious racism, systematic racism, which is stems through government and, and everything. They do differ, and but they still both 
I would say hurt the same. And I obviously, I think I'm lucky I haven't properly, well, not properly experienced, I have properly experienced direct racism. I just, I don't experience it all the time. Maybe I would say maybe once every two months. I would say, I bet people hearing that is probably think that's shocking still that I get that. But I know there's people who get it every day. I know there's people who get it every week. So I, I feel like I don't receive it that much, but once is too much, isn't it? Of um, course it is. Anthony, when I uh, read the piece, and for any of the listeners, it's on it's on the website, celticfanzine.com. It has been read by an awful lot of people. Within the first half hour, there was over a thousand people had read the article. And I've experienced indirect racism as a white Irish person because mm-hmm. uh, I remember in Tenerife on holidays, uh, a barman called me uh, Paddy. And I said, mm-hmm. no, my name is Andrew. No, I didn't know this was racism at the time. I said, yeah. no, my name is Andrew. And he goes, oh, you're all tick mix. So uh, I, I left the pub, but, you know, I, I, and then I, I, I kind of thought to myself, you know, is this what everyone, because it was like one of my first, I suppose, foreign holidays with my, with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. Is this how people are treated who are a different colour? I then met mm. a, a friend from Drada who is uh, of dark skinned. I don't know his origins. He grew up in the same council estate as me. Mm. And, uh, but as Irish as can be, he was right. refused entry into a nightclub because of the colour of his skin, even though he had just got, he tanned up on his skin, but he was dark skinned. Right? So mm. I thought, you know, this is a strange place to be when this is happening to Irish people. Like, right, and right. having been brought up in an anti-racist family and hadn't having listened to bands like Dispersions and that, who found my opinion on politics and race, I was quite shocked. But it, you're from Aberdeen, and after an Aberdeen game, I was in the toilet with uh, a mate of mine, Raj, who mm. was of Indian origins, and you probably met Raj at the games. He goes to a lot of home and away games. I think I've met him on uh, away trips. Well, I've certainly met. Our Raj, who I, I, who I always big hands, or we always uh, big hands, Raj, yeah, yeah, in, in, in Amsterdam and Salzburg and things like that, yeah. And it was the first weekend I'd ever met Raj. I'd been introduced by a friend, and we had a great weekend. We were up in Aberdeen for the match. We'd won that day, and a little Celtic fan came in, and he turned around to Raj and he says, "Are you my taxi driver?" To which I uh, I intervened because fair play to Raj, he didn't hit the little guy, but. He felt like doing it because it was just such an inappropriate comment. But yeah. the little guy was chuckling, you know, and saying, oh, calm down, there's nothing. But it, it it does go on around us all. And maybe sometimes we do turn the blind eye to it, even though we are anti-racist. Yeah, and I, I think that's the important thing I was trying to emphasise, is that this, we often see racism as a very far-right and right-wing thing that happens. But uh, it's... Obviously, the direct racist abuse is usually from far right and right wing people and movements and organisations. There is a left wing racism, if you want to call it that, that seems to be indirect racism, where people are cultural culturally aware and they're trying to be, they're trying to show that they're culturally aware. So I mentioned how I can go into M and S and buy a chicken and bacon sandwich and be questioned, or not questioned, but just told, you know, there's bacon in this. Yeah, I do. I don't want to. I don't feel I should have to explain my existence and my identity to this person. I, I shouldn't have to say, "Well, I'm Christian." Um, I shouldn't have to say that to someone at the till when I'm buying a sandwich. So that that's the. But they they mean well. They're trying to be culturally aware. They're trying to show that they're culturally aware, and they don't mean any harm. But that can hurt just as much because what that does is it makes me aware. Wait a minute. I've oh yeah. I'm, I've got brown skin. I'm not the norm here if you know what I mean even though it's in London where you are it can happen and I shouldn't have to feel that I'm aware of my own skin colour when I'm buying a sandwich in a shop or going to the pub or or whatever and that's that's what I wanted to emphasise is that it's not just a far right movement racism or a far right problem we need to address it or set, people who are non-racist and anti-racist can also be can also racially profile and we just need to self-reflect. We all can do it. It doesn't matter what colour of skin you are. We all can do it. We just need to self-reflect and realise what we are what we are doing or who we are talking to. Or as I know, it's 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 quite hard to explain because it's a very complex complex issue. And it's because it's subconscious and because it's not seen. So many people will think that's not racist or oh, you didn't mean it like that or things like that. But often I. 
I hear that and I get that, but I'm, I also know if I was white or if I was a different color, I, I wouldn't be asked that question. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have the, that experience. So uh, skin color is an element, racial profiling is an element, and it's not always right wing and far right, because it doesn't always have to be, racism doesn't always have to be discrimination and direct abuse. Because of your skin color, we all love our away trips to Europe. They're, they're just the highlights of the season. We don't get too many wins away this year with a bit more luck. But you also travel away with, with the Tartan Army to watch Scotland. And I love going away with Ireland as well. Now, I don't fear going anywhere. I don't fear going into you know Italy. I don't fear going into East Europe where the right is on the rise or, or, or right. certain parts of Spain or, or wherever. Because yeah. of your skin colour, is there anywhere you wouldn't travel or you would be fearful of travelling? That's a good question. It is something I think about when I'm booking a trip. For example, like when the stuff happens with the Bulgaria and England squad, um, you do worry about coming in just on your walk to the game. If you come up across the, the wrong group of people, if I'm just with, if I'm in a group of my mates, even with 15 people, if there's 20 or 30 other fans who's, I always think, well, I'm likely to be the target if that was to happen. So I, th- th- that does go through my head, but no, not in the same, not in a serious thought that's going to make me think, no, I'm definitely not going there. Russia, when Scotland played Russia, I did want to go there just because of, just because I've never been to Russia. And I, I love going, part of the reason I do these trips is because I like to go to places I've never been. Like Albania, it's not somewhere that would be high up on my holiday list, but I've, I, I went there for the Scotland game and I, I loved it. It was great. And everyone was very welcome in there. Russia, yeah, I, as much as I wanted to go there, I also thought I did have thoughts in my head of, hmm, will I be okay there? I get that a lot. The one, the great example of it is Lazio. So when that draw came out, I remember like looking at Twitter and I could see all the Celtic fans buzzing to go to Rome and thinking, oh, that's the trip, that's going to be amazing. As well as thinking it's going to be amazing, I had my reservations because I was like, they're of trouble and I hate trouble at football games anyway. Luckily, I've not, had to, I've not properly seen it. But the thought of a very left-wing supported club against probably one of the most racist and fascist clubs in Europe and their fan base. I was definitely wary of that. And I was aware that, yeah, well, if I go and there is trouble, I'm going to be quite a big target. If I'm in a Celtic shirt and I've got this colour this color of skin, I, I would be high up on a tar- on, as a target for who they go to hit or do whatever they want to do. And I'm certainly not a fighter. I've never been a fighter in my life. I wouldn't be able to stand my ground for a start. <laughs> um, but obviously, I, I regret not going. But we went to Rennes, we went to Cluj, and that, that was great. So finances actually made my decision. It wasn't because of the colour of my skin that I didn't go. I would make that clear. <sighs> After seeing the result and seeing the fans in in the Stadio Olimpico, I was jealous, definitely jealous that I didn't go to, but it wasn't because of the colour of my skin that I didn't go to that game. I would say it's something I think about, but not. it's not going to determine my, dis, it's not going to make my, the decision for me. The colour of my skin is not going to make me not go to a country or a certain trip abroad. Uh, maybe at club level, I'll think about it more, could be because you have far right movements. Uh, at a football game, I remember being on a stag do in Krakow and we were going to a Vyskovia game and we were walking there and Kra- Krakow was it was brilliant and we it's it's quite an open open city. There was there was no problems there. But as we started walking closer and closer to the ground, I realized mm, I'm the only person of colour here. I'm getting some funny looks. We also had our stag dressed up as a woman, which was obviously attracting attention. So as soon as we arrived outside the ground, we had one of our mates collecting the tickets while the rest of us were all in a a little group. And the Krakowia hooligans, which they had in their their hoodies that said Krakowia hooligans, all in black hoodies, were just staring at us, completely staring at us. And I could tell I was getting stares, but the attention was, the attention was more on, our stag, who was dressed as a dressed as a blonde woman, um, but 
I could also see I was getting looks and there's just about maybe 10 of us and there would be, <laughs> there was a big group of them who were just staring at us while we waited. And one of them actually came over to us, didn't say anything to me. So he was asking my mate why he's dressed like that. And we just said, oh, we're from Scotland. Uh, it's bachelor party. And he just said, we don't like this. And walked back and well, he told us to fuck off. And uh, that, that had nothing to do with my colour of skin. That was, I was just trying to explain that I was getting the looks and I think people who are white in the Western world probably don't know what that look is, but when you're my colour or whatever and you're in these situations, you definitely know that look. And sometimes it can't, it's not always unfriendly. Sometimes like I can be at a Scotland away trip and people are just looking, just trying to, not confusion, but just trying to work it out in their heads, you can tell as I walk past in my kilt and my Scotland top. (laughs) (laughs) It's not not always unfriendly, but then as soon as I speak, then there's often the problems. People, people, it's almost like a light bulb moment. Oh, oh, he is Scottish, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's It's, funny, as as a white person, I've never been asked what religion I am. I've never been mistaken. uh, What do they presume? All Irish people are Catholic, which I was brought up. But I know from reading your article that, you know, you people think you're a Sikh, they think you're a Muslim, they think oh, you're yeah. a vegetarian, they think you're an immigrant, you know, like it, it must be a pain in the ass for you as well, that you constantly these challenges having to explain who you are. Uh, I don't, I try not to let it affect me. Like a lot of my friends have said to me, oh, Tony, I didn't realise that happens to you every, every other day. or Because I don't really... Unless it's direct abuse, I never mention it to my mates or uh, to family or my girlfriend or anything. It's always, it's just, I just almost accept it, but because I can't be bothered. If I if I was to challenge every single time I have experienced indirect uh, or subconscious racism like that or racial profiling, it would be, it's a waste of a life in a way, but I do, I do appreciate that I do need to use my platform and also my ability and my experiences to speak up about it and especially when it's being it's so topical at the moment that's why I felt it was the right time to to do it even though I dithered over sending it or not and I remember texting you first saying I'm not sure I'm going to whether I'm going to but I'm thinking about doing this and uh slowly put my mind at ease thinking and I felt yes this is the right platform to do it because I also didn't want to do it from a professional point of view I want this to be me as Anthony Joseph the Celtic fan from Scotland rather than me as Sky Sports News news editor I wanted it to be just about me not about me as a media person well I'm glad you sent in the article because the reaction as I said has been amazing the readership of it and it's a quality article and we try, we try to get as much quality as we can onto the website because it's there for people to read it doesn't cost anything but you don't want to be just thrown up try it you want at least a bit of quality because we've always tried to have some quality in, in the fans in well I just want to say to you that I got a WhatsApp message before I came on here and it was from uh, Raj who I spoke about earlier on who, who we had Hi. we had the incident in Aberdeen and the words Raj said was, it's about fucking time. Mm-hmm. So he's happy that you wrote the article. Yeah, well, that's that's great if I can be the the voice in, in that capacity. And also just, just for people to self-reflect. I've had so many comments uh, saying, look, I, people just saying that they've thought those things, they've said those things, and but reading that, they're going to self-reflect and they think they, they need to change, they just need to... Just do better. It's because, like I was saying, it's not malicious. Singing Emilio Izaguirre song to me is not malicious. It's not bad. It's not. It's not. It doesn't make you a bad person for doing that. But it just makes me aware of my skin color when I'm walking amongst people who I regard as my fellow people. If you know what I mean, as in fellow Celtic fans, it's or Scotland fans or whatever. It's uh, it's just trying to make people realise and reflect. That's all. That's all I wanted to do, and I think hopefully, certainly from some of the comments I've got, it's it's hopefully doing that, and uh, I'm glad to, to have been given that platform to do it. So I'm grateful to to the website and the fanzine and everything because I wanted to do it 
from my personal point of view rather than from me in a professional capacity. I, I'm glad you've done it as well because it, had, it got me thinking because I would class myself as an anti-racist in all my life. But when I reflect back, I probably have past comments, you know, I probably have had the crack with you and I probably have had the crack with Raj, thinking I'm having the crack, but not thinking that maybe, maybe he doesn't think it's funny, you know. As you say, you don't mean it. But, you know, I will now think about it because, uh, you know, sometimes maybe we all need to practice a bit more what we preach. Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. And that's that's a huge thing is Celtic fans like to, we like to think of ourselves as anti-racist, the anti-fascist club, a very left-wing club, but we can still, we can still do so much better as people and as fans collectively. And how uncomfortable, Anthony, do you feel by the colour of your skin that you don't fit into the typical stereotype of the Scottish person? That's always something that has bothered me and probably more bothered me down here because it's to be honest at, at home I never really experienced it pretty much all my friends are are white don't really have any issues when I'm at, when I'm at home Ever, oh, Port Lethen's a small part of Aberdeenshire and every, sort of everyone knows who everyone and everyone knows my family as well and it's, there's never been any problems that I can think of so it's like I was I said in the piece I've never been more aware of my skin colour since I moved down to London and it's I don't feel uncomfortable in it sometimes I just I feel like I I can't be bothered speaking here or I can't be bothered even just like ordering drinks at a bar you know you'll maybe get a funny not a funny look but like people just trying to work out did that guy just have a Scottish accent or things like that I just uh, and I know if they do comment then they're they're going to want to know more and sometimes you just can't be bothered it's, it's so tiring having to explain your existence and identity a lot for for who you are and yeah I, I wouldn't say I feel uncomfortable in my skin I'm proud of my heritage and my family's heritage but I'm also proud of and, and that is part of my makeup obviously but I'm also proud of who I am and I am just a 28 year old man from Scotland and I shouldn't I shouldn't be anything in other people's eyes. I shouldn't be anything else unless unless we're t- having a deep conversation and it gets into the point where you're talking about your family's upbringing. Like that. that shouldn't be the first or second question you ask someone, where are you originally from? When you can quite, quite clearly, clearly hear that hear. from Scotland. Um, that's something you talk about if you're if you're in the pub meeting someone new and you're, you've been chatting away all afternoon and that you get into family history and things like that. That's not something you say to a stranger. But in terms of being feeling uncomfortable, I don't feel uncomfortable, but it's a pet hate of mine always having to explain my identity and explain why I'm brown, basically. You walk in the media now, you're a Celtic fan. You walk for the Daily Mail, who many Celtic fans would have reservations of. I also know Celtic fans who walk for tabloids in Ireland and in Glasgow. And yeah. I'm not saying they hide it, but they don't go preaching about it. But it's a job yeah. and it pays it pays their wages and it pays for the mortgage and it pays for the kids to be fed. Yeah. So I you know, I'm not I'm not looking down and um, saying, Oh, you shouldn't write for certain publications because then we wouldn't be watching a lot of television because <laughs> they're all owned by the same groups. Yeah. But as a Celtic fan, you were a Celtic fan before you joined the media or the mainstream media. Is there a bias in the media? towards Celtic or are we just paranoid you mean to you mean against Celtic yes. or towards um no I would I wouldn't say there's a bias against Celtic I would say they're on contentious issues and political issues and societal issues there's a need for the equalization or balance so often something can be done I think uh, this is this is more this is less about Celtic. This is more about balance and pol- in politics. Uh, and I will give my local newspaper, as uh, the Evening Express, when I was working there, as the perfect example of this. We tried to remain impartial for the Scottish independence referendum, and do everything down the line as an equal. So if we had this amount of, if we had a whole page on the yes movement, we had to have a whole page on the no movement. And often you found that the Yes movement was just a bigger movement in terms of parades and marches and things like that. 
but we had to try and find something just as big to to promote the no side. And often I think that gets misplaced in terms of when we're talking about sectarianism and racism, and that's heavily involved with Celtic and Rangers. And it's made people think that calling someone a Fenian bastard is the same as calling someone a Hun bastard or an orange bastard when it's not. It's not they're not equal. They're not on parallel terms. One is intrinsically racist and sectarian. The others are very much political and not borderline sectarian. But we we have this perception that we have to be equal. And that's where I, I tweeted about it today because Nicola Sturgeon was hitting out at uh, loyalists um, who were basically attacking a pro-refugee march in Glasgow, in George Square. And she called them racist thugs. And... I agree. They are. It was disgraceful, and they are racist thugs. Those people that were there, but because we give them that in Scottish society, we give them that platform as if we're too afraid to offend them. We're we're pandering to that kind of ideology, and so people think it's accepted. So people think it's acceptable for anti-Catholic marches to go past Catholic churches, for the killing of Catholics to be celebrated, anti-Irish racism to be celebrated because <laughs> they, they feel it has to level itself out and there was nothing more in the whole anti, an, sorry, offensive behaviour at Football Bill. One SMP, MSP said we need to even the score because Rangers fans were getting done for the current sectarianism and racist laws that exist in Scotland, but they weren't able to get Celtic fans properly on sectarianism. They were getting thrown out of court on some of the songs, the Irish Republican songs. So they so they implemented the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act to level it so they could they could be seen to be tackling the problem. But it turned out to be counterproductive and it, because you're you're criminalizing football fans and you're also pandering to an ideology that should be way in the past. It's a, a right wing and far right ideology that should it shouldn't even be in this country. It shouldn't be anywhere in society. So you, you think that it suits the media to have to say that? I completely understand why they do it because they're just they're not thinking about uh, the bigger picture and creating a fairer society because they're they're thinking about just reporting on what's going on now as it is rather than as a bigger picture or and not offending a huge chunk of their leadership which it is. It's, a, it's such a complex issue and I, I feel I don't, I don't know the whole answer to it either of how you do that and, and run a newspaper as in, in a city like Glasgow or in a, in a country where it's, it's so divisive like that and you've got such polarised opinions and, well, and viewpoints. And it's, it's, it's hard. I, I don't have the, all the answers to that, but I just think that by making it an equal cause, both tackling the anti-Irish and anti-Catholic uh, uh, sectarianism and racism by making it an equal cause to far-right motives, it's it's dangerous and it gives them a it gives a platform and it's also like a breeding platform. It makes it people young people think, oh, it's actually okay because it's just just as bad as that, if you know what I mean. And I think that's that's a big problem. So I. Football terms, I do not think there is a bias in the Scottish media. I think it, everyone reads things the way they want to read it. I've, I've been accused of being a Rangers fan when I was working at uh, the Evening Express in, in Aberdeen for some of the things I've written. I've been accused of ev- everything. So it's uh, of supporting any club or supporting any cause or anything like that. So it's people like to read into what they they believe in and see it the way see it with their tinted glasses often but if you were to look at the football aspect objectively I wouldn't say there's bias in the media when it comes to the political and societal problems um, that Scotland faces and especially when it comes to sectarianism and racial divide I think yeah there's bias because you're equaling it and they're trying to balance it out all the time from one side if you're talking about one side you've got to talk about the other and I think that's a very dangerous uh, precedent you set for future generations. But it's also the reason why it's it's still quite prominent in society. Now, moving on, Anthony, uh, while we're on media, and you raised some very good points there and points that um, 
I've always felt that, you know, they've tried to paint both teams in Glasgow with the same brush when, when we couldn't be more opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a debate that goes on and on and on. But fan media has come an awful long way since the humble beginnings of the photocopied fans in. We now have blogger websites, podcasts, fan TV, thanks to YouTube and social media, etc. With so much content, I sometimes feel that, that the quality gets lost with some bloggers using click and bait websites to get mm -hmm. static fans in so they can get paid for clicks on Google adverts. There's also a number of so-called static websites that will offer a free gift to follow them. But when you look deeper into these companies, they have websites on the club across the city and other football teams and they're and supposed to be independent Celtic fan websites. And also, we seem to have a culture now of a websites with the Google Ads thing of basically cut and pasting tabloid stories, adding a new headline. And even some of them will go as far as saying the sun said or the record said. And I've seen stuff taken from the official website and basically not changed at all and just blatantly put up. So, like, from my point of view, and I'm a bit older than you, Anthony, I'm 48, I started reading fanzines in the mid-80s, probably the early 80s. My brothers would have brought them home, music ones. But football fanzines I start reading in the mid to late 80s. Uh, I, 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 still, I still get it every month, not the view. But they were set up as an independent voice to oppose the Celtic view and the tabloid press. But yeah. now it seems to be, it seems to have got lost with some of the, with modern technology, it seems to have got lost that people maybe, maybe they're aiming to get themselves a job at the club or a newspaper and they think this is the route to go down. But for me, it's lazy journalism. What's your opinions on it? Yeah, it can be. And uh, I don't click on, I know some of my friends who constantly click on these links that so Celtic to make star signing or massive signing in the summer or things like that, just click a click a headline I don't know where you stop I don't, I don't really take much notice of it I never click on them and I, I, I enjoy I think there is a base for proper fan ind independent fan media like more than 90 minutes um the Celtic Soul pack podcast I even like 90 minutes cynic podcast I used to listen to I still do listen to all the time a Celtic state of mind podcast as well I, I listen to that I see that as uh proper fan media actually doing journalistic work by Celtic fans for Celtic fans and and going out and getting interviews, interviewing musicians, TV stars, former players, fans, journalists. That it's think that's the kind of new media and independent media that is really good and strong and has the platform now with Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, podcast apps. And that and that's great. Um, I, I don't really have much to say on the clickbait sites because you can't stop people from doing it. People can create a website all they want, what, what their motives are. Can you really make that much money off of off a few clicks? Because I, th I think you're just going to piss up, piss people off when you click on a story that says Celtic to make amazing transfer signing, and then you click on it and it's just some some rumor or uh, based on someone's tweet that isn't even of of any sort of relevance or something like that, you get a lot of these people who claim to be football agents on Twitter, and you see, I've seen uh, blog posts or um, websites taking story, making a story out of, out of out of nothing like that. There's some really good independent fan media out there, not just within within Celtic. There's it's really get like some of the top podcasts are done by uh, and football podcasts are done by fans and you're, you're seeing them grow I've, I've seen that uh, there's one in Scottish football I can't remember the name uh, of it there's uh, another guy in the northeast who's just who I was uh, featured on is Campbell's Footballs and he just he just decided to do podcasts and he's got some amazing names on there like Rob McLean and Ian Crocker and some top footballers and Craig Brown people like that it just just a guy had no journalism background and can create some good journalistic content and that's what fan media is important and independent fan media is is better because you don't nobody wants to hear that everything's rosy at Celtic because sometimes it's not often it's not or taking the club line on everything that's that's not what it's for independent fan media gives fans the platform to scrutinize and almost 
take on club hierarchy on certain issues and decision making as well. And it should be used in the same way that the national media and mainstream media does to government or governing bodies and things like that. And it, ha it has its place and it has a very good place. I don't think too much of the, the clickbait websites that call themselves uh, fan media. Yeah, it's just sometimes I find some things get lost and then I might find the blogger and he could be writing for two or three years and you go, how did I never hear of this guy, you know? How did mm -hmm. I never hear of this guy? Because it's buried among people putting content out. Yeah. Uh -huh. Twice, it's a tough three, three you times an hour, it. you know? No, you can't yeah. stop them, but they're putting it two or three times an hour, pushing down, I suppose, the decent stuff. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's just my opinion as well. But before I let you go, and you're looking back on last season, what were the highs for you and what are your ex expectations on the upcoming season as we try to make a historical 10 in a row? Yeah, um, highlights from last season. There's, there's quite a lot. I'm going back to the Rangers game at Ibrox, winning that 2-0. I think that was the very first Rangers game since uh, they've been in the Premiership that I've, I've felt... Uh, Oh, we're not going to win this. We're not going to do this well. Only eight hundred fans in the in the away end. I I remember talking to my, my mate Joe Boyle, who was we went to the Wimbledon club uh, for that for that game, and this it was summer's day. It was great, and we were both just like, oh, I don't, I'm not confident at all. And then suddenly put on a very professional performance, managed it so well and got the 2-0 win, which was which was amazing. That's definitely a huge highlight to win at Ibrox. And then some of the Europa League performances, Lazio at home, Lazio away. They're going for the Serie A title. They could, they could well be champions of Italy and we went, we beat them home and away and deserved to as well. So obviously the low point was losing that game as well as the Champions League exit, losing that game to Rangers at, at home over New Year, and I was at that one, and that was that was really tough to take. But for some reason, and my friends can tell you this, I was not worried. I still thought Celtic would win the league quite comfortably, and I said I even bet a few of my mates who support Rangers that we'd win the league by ten points or more. And still waiting for the money because apparently the league was cancelled. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, but and and we did. And the way they came back from Dubai was impressive. Came with a real purpose, and you really looked to that, and you you thought we're going on to something something special here. I think Copenhagen at home hurt more than losing to Rangers um, over New Year because I really thought. If we beat Copenhagen, can go on and have a proper go at the Europa League. You're what in the quarter? You're in the last sixteen, just two games away from the quarterfinals. That was that was the major disappointment. But then getting the, the league form, you couldn't take that away from them. They were superb, and it's it's hard to now assess what's going to happen because we don't know what's going to happen with transfer windows. How much money we'll have to spend? How much? Who's going to be there? Will they get Fraser Forster? Things like that. We could have a different team going for 10, but it's quietly optimistic because it's just going to be such a weird season next season. And we'll still have the Scottish Cup games to play as well um, to potentially make it a quadruple treble. But it's so hard to gauge. How, how are we going to cope not playing in, in front of 60,000 fans and just playing in front of no one? Um, I certainly think the away games will be easier, like going to Pitodri, uh, we'll going to Tyne Castle. Oh, actually, no, might not get Tyne Castle. Um, going to Easter Road, things like that. Lynn, our record's not great at Easter Road. That'll be easier. What we've seen in the Bundesliga and in Spain is that away to the top, the much better team going away from home finds it easier. Not And it's, uh, away wins have been rife throughout the Bundesliga and this um, new era of no fans. And I think you might see that in Scotland with Celtic and Rangers quite comfortably beating teams away from home when there's no fans. So that that could be interesting. It's, it's just going to be so weird. I, honestly, it's unprecedented, so I, I can't really make a proper prediction of how I feel it's going to go. I, I do like to think we've got a stronger squad at the moment, but we don't know. We don't know what that's going to be like come August or whenever it's safe to start the league. Now, Anthony, uh, before you go, uh, I'd just like to 
thank you very much for coming on. For a 28-year-old, you've certainly uh, lived a lot, put up Thanks with a lot. And, and <laughs> if anyone wants to um, read your article, uh, which goes into it in more detail, it's on the CelticFansIn.com website, Indirect Racism, a Celtic fan story. But before I let you go, promise me, and promise me that the other end of Sky Sports now, that we won't see you in a gym white yellow tie. <laughs> I'm not sure what the protocol is. I might have to get a yellow tie for, for transfer deadline day, but I certainly won't be on camera on it anyway. Well, that's that's sort of anyway. Anthony, <laughs> thank you so much. And hopefully I'll catch it in Glasgow for a point or maybe on our trips to Europe. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm choking for a, a pint abroad watching Celtic or Scotland or anywhere. But just it'll be such an amazing feeling when we can go back to Celtic Park and hopefully be on course for 10 in a row and also be looking forward to some European trip away from home. It'll be, it's going to be the best feeling ever. But th- thanks, Andrew, for having me on. And also thanks for giving me the, the platform yesterday to write my story and my experiences, which can hopefully make people self-reflect and educate as well. And I'm, I'm glad, definitely grateful for that. And we thank you. And I'm sure everyone that read the article thanks you as well, because I'm sure there's other people who have proper some of the nonsense that you have had to put up with. So, Andy, once again, thank you very much, and I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Once again, I would like to thank Anthony for coming on the show and sharing his story with us. I think you'll all agree that any form of racism needs to be eradicated. Coming up on next Tuesday's podcast, I will be chatting to Paul Bourne. Paul was signed by Liam Brady. He also played under Lou McCary before Tommy Bones took over the reins at Celtic. Please like and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on any episodes. The Celtic Soul podcast is available on all podcast platforms. It's also available on our library at CelticFanzine.com. On the website you will find daily news and articles and you can also visit our online shop where we have a new range of merchandise. And a big thanks to everyone who has bought from the shop in the last couple of weeks. It really, really has helped us with the production of this podcast. And your continued support will enable us to build our independent media Celtic fan platform. Please keep in contact through social media, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And keep all the stories and comments coming in to info at CelticFanzine.com. We want to hear from you. Once again, thanks very much to my producer, Ronan McQuillan, and to our sponsor, the Badass Cafe Temple Bar Dublin, home of Nave Park Celtic Supporters Club. Well, folks, enjoy your weekend. I know I'm going to. I'm going to be celebrating with my son, Connor, who's 21. We can't go to the pub yet, but we'll have a few social distance drinks. So keep the faith, and more importantly, stay safe. <laughs>